What's going on good people? If you're watching this, it's because you're in AP Human Geography and you have to learn about regional analysis, topic 1.7. You come to the right place. Here we go. Let's start. So what are you going to learn in this lecture? Well, you're going to learn that geographers analyze really complex issues and relationships in these issues uh, with a distinctly, distinctively spatial perspective. That means that they take in, into account regions. And so for instance, I have a map here that shows the precipitation levels in the United States. And if I wanted to, I could already split this country up here into two really different regions based on the levels of precipitation. So the, the eastern part of the country and the western part of the country. And what I just did there is what geographers do when they look at patterns and processes in data. So what are the key points of this lecture? These are the things that you should really know by the time you finish. Number one, regions are areas with one or more unifying characteristics or patterns of activities. Two, the types of regions there are are formal, functional, and perceptual. These are the ones that geographers use. And regional boundaries can be transitional, they can be contested or debated, and they can be overlapping. That means that they're not uh, finite, they're not well-defined in some cases. Uh, and then finally, the geographers use these regional analyses at local, national, and global scales. Okay, so let's get started. So what is a region specifically? It's an area or a segment of the Earth that geographers use in order to analyze a common characteristic or an activity that these areas share. So here's North America, for instance. And here's some of the things that North America shares. So common characteristics could be physical, things like climates, mountain chains, river systems. And then things like economic trade or immigration or even political and military alliances. So let's take a look at the physical first. Here's a map of the North American continent. And as you can tell already, there are some commonalities. So for instance, if we zoom in here to the United States and Canada, we see that the Rocky Mountains and the Great Plains extend all the way into each of those two countries. So they share a common characteristic, which is a physical feature. And then if I go into a place like Mexico, for instance, I can see that the, the desert area in the southwest United States goes into Mexico. So that's another uh, characteristic that they have in common. So this is why we kind of group these three countries into North America, at least in this part of the world where I'm from, which is uh, southern uh, southwestern Texas. We always combine these areas because we call this whole thing the North American continent. Okay. Now, in terms of trade, economically speaking, these three regions are really connected. So you have Canada, for example, in the upper region that is connected economically to the United States and Mexico through trade. So we call this trade agreement that we signed back in the 90s, we call it the NAFTA trade agreement, which stands for North American Free Trade Agreement. And uh, it was recently uh, revised and re-signed again uh, under the presidency of President Donald Trump. And so we have, for example, here, products that are being assembled and manufactured both in um, Mexico and in Canada and that are traveling into the United States fully assembled in trailer trucks through this highway system that is in the United States. Now, because these three countries are connected and interdependent with each other, we call this an economic region. So we literally call this the economic corridor of North America. And so as you can tell in Mexico, there are several places where these items can be assembled in factories called maquiladoras. Okay. So all the way up to Canada and into the United States. These are all interconnected regions. So what types of regions are there? Well, there's three types. Formal, also known as uniform or homogenous. Functional regions, also known as nodal regions. And perceptual regions, also known as vernacular regions. So if you see these names because maybe you're taking a test, that is the same thing as the ones in the blue label. Okay. So let's talk about formal regions specifically. These are areas in which most people and places have a common characteristic. So these regions help us analyze and they help us explain broad patterns and processes in, in a place. Uh, so examples of these could be governments and political regions. So let's take a look at one. So here's the country of Iraq or Iraq as some people call it. And within that red boundary line is the government of Iraq. So the governmental policies, the governmental rules, they all extend into each one of those parts of Iraq. So because it has a clearly defined boundary, we call this a uniform or homogenous or a formal region. And so in your brain, you should think of the word uniform and you should think of the fact that it's the same in every part of that area. So that's why it's a formal region. Okay, so let's take a look at functional regions next. So these nodal regions are areas organized around a node or a center focal point or place where there is a central focus and that focus starts to diminish as you move outward uh, the importance diminishes as you move outward. 
So an example of this could be like a pizza delivery route, pizza delivery zone, and a cell phone coverage area. So where the signal ends for a cell phone company. So for instance here, I have a pizza place that I started and I'm gonna deliver pizzas. But I decided that I'm gonna kinda draw out a map and tell my customers, hey, this green area, this green star here, that's where I'm gonna deliver for sure. But if you live out there by this other region, I don't think I'm going to deliver that far. It wouldn't be in my best economic interest to deliver. Okay. Perceptual regions are the last kind of region here. And these are places and areas that people subjectively suppose they exist as part of their own cultural identity or as part of their sense of place. Uh, these are more subjective and abstract. In other words, they can mean different things for different people. So for instance, there's a south and in where we live in the city of El Paso, there's an area called the Lower Valley. So here's an example of what I mean. If we were to take the United States here and literally divide it into four distinct regions, okay, using the power of geometry, uh, we would notice that if we ask people, hey, where's the South? A lot of people would likely say that it's this area right here. Okay? But it's not agreed upon. There's a lot of give and take. There's a lot of people that say, yeah, sure, I'm in the South. There's a lot of people that say, no, we're not in the South. So what I mean by this is that it's contested. It's uh, overlapping in some cases. Some people say, yes, we're in the South. Some people say, no, we're not in the South. We're part of the West. We're part of the Midwest. It just depends on who you ask, right? But in general, these are the most agreed upon. And even at that, I'm saying it a little fuzzy because it's not for sure. These are the generally agreed upon areas that are in the South. So the last thing that you should know here is that there's some caveats. In other words, regional boundaries are transitional. Sometimes they change, right? And they're often contested and overlapping. So sometimes they're for sure, sometimes they're debated, sometimes they overlap, okay? So here's an example of what I mean. Here's the United Nations geo scheme map for the world's regions. And even within the United Nations, there's disagreement or there's different maps for where the regions are. So here, for example, we have sub-regions and in this same map from, from the United Nations, we have these larger region, regional groups, right? And uh, even if I do a quick search on Bing or Google, I can find another map, like the one from Wikimedia that tells me specifically where these regions are. So there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of debate. There's a lot of contest. Con uh, these boundaries are contested. So finally here, geographers use regional analysis at local, national, and global scales. That means that they can take regions and divide them further into different levels. For instance, here's the southwestern United States. Even though this area has a common characteristic, which is that it's in a desert or it has a desert climate, even within that desert, there are variations. There are differences in the desert. So the desert from California may look very different from the desert from Utah. They might look similar in many ways, but in many ways they are distinct. They are unique. Right? So for instance, if we go into New Mexico here, I can find that even within New Mexico, there are different kinds of climates. Uh, in the northern part of New Mexico, there's a lot of uh, warmer Mediterranean continental climates, a little more precipitation. And then when you come down to the south uh, eastern part of New Mexico, uh, bordering here with the uh, region where we live, there are less uh, moist environments. There are a lot more dry desert environments. So this is what I mean when I say that there's variations at different scales. Okay. And then so here are the takeaways you should leave with. Regions can be subjective. That means they can mean different things to different people. And regions are based largely on commonalities or things that they have in common. Okay. Hope you learned something. Subscribe if you liked this video and uh, leave a comment uh, telling me which one of these regions was most easy to understand, which one was most confusing. Okay. See you later.